anyone has any questions they'd like to, to ask, uh, we'll try to field your questions. One of the reasons I stopped where I did is that um, I wrote a book uh, many years ago called The Majority Papers, which covers the work of the Tommy Gale up to the death of uh, Joe McGarrity of Philadelphia in 1940, in August of 1940. And I'm not saying this to boost sales. The book is out of print. Vincent had tried to get it from the publisher, but they said that uh, there was only a few copies left. But that was one reason it didn't seem to be necessary, and I dealt with the untold story, which is the previous one. The book Sean refers to, uh, written by Sean, I think came out about 1972, the majority papers. It, it, it was based on extensive files left uh, uh, by Joe McGarty to his successor, Mike McGinn, who was born and in County Cabin, became district officer after Joe McGarty, and these papers became available to County Gale, and uh, Sean spent a couple of years reading through them and came up with the, the paper, like uh, the McGarty papers. A committee of County Gale at the moment is considering uh, reissuing this book that without Vincent Condon, there would not have been a majority papers either. Because he physically shifted stuff from basements and collected it and made enemies in the process. Well, all I did was read the stuff. Now, if he does the same <laughs> in this case, and I must say also, uh, I should say here, that I have the help of Seamus McDermott's son, uh, uh, Jim McDermott, and Seamus McDermott was the last editor of the Gaelic American, and of course he was the brother of Sean McDermott, uh, of the 1916 leader, so that I have very worthy support and should move a little far quicker in this time, John. The, the uh, majority papers uh, cover uh, a great span of uh, Tlani Gale history. It covers uh, 40 years the majority years. And well, uh, the whole point of history is one that attempts to be objective. I don't know who created the uh, split, but uh, certainly they were at cross purposes, and there were a number of things on both sides. Uh, first of all, de Valera, as president of the Republic, was made president of the Republic by Joe McGarrity because de Valera's role as the leader of Sinn Féin, when Sinn Féin formed Dáil Éireann in 1919, and they formed the cabinet, and he was the Priyavara, which means the prime minister, the chief minister. But uh, when he arrived secretly in America, Joe McGarrity said, well, that won't do. They don't understand that here. You're president, de Valera. So from then on, he was well known as President de Valera. And uh, the split with clan, or what is often referred to as the old clan, because the clan did split, McGarrity supported de Valera, and de Valera was to say that without Joe McGarrity, there would be no Republic in America. And having gone into this matter in the McGarrity papers, uh, for my own safety, I better leave it at that, other than to say that by then, Devoy was old, quite old, old to the point that when there was a Royal Commission set up in Dublin Castle into the causes of the Rising, the judge in charge said, this Devoy you mentioned, Surely, this is not the Du Bois of the 1860s, the 1870s. Is he still alive? Yes. It was the same Du Bois. And uh, here was a man who had dealt in equal terms with Parnell. <coughs> so uh, de Valera didn't mean all that much to him. But he was willing to work with the Irish movement, quite clearly would have. But he was a hard, irascible man. And uh, many of those, de Valera was not a person that you could dictate to or tell him what to do. So I think there was, first of all, a clash of personalities. De Valera represented the Irish Republic as he saw it, the dignity of the new Irish state, 
which was fighting for its existence, and money that was being collected in America uh, with the Friends of Irish Freedom. Some of this money was being used to defeat the League of Nations, which was then a big issue. They wanted to defeat Wilson. And I believe that you can probably get your enemy to a point, and Wilson was their enemy. He had called them traitors to America for opposing the war. And Wilson was the man who supported the League of Nations. But for Ireland, a small country, the League of Nations was almost an essential thing. So they clashed on that. They clashed on the disposal of money. Money raised for Ireland should go to Ireland was de Valera's point of view. It's a long, involved story. And you would almost need a judicial decision at the end of it as to where right or wrong was. But the clan split. The majority went for de Valera. The old clan stayed with Du Bois and later Cahallon and the Gaelic American. And Paul O'Dwyer knows quite a lot about that. And I will finish with one what I consider a rather funny story. Uh, when I was doing research for Washington's Irish policy in the National Archives in Washington, I naturally went into the correspondence of the State Department dealing with Ireland during the war years. And uh, an official at the State Department sent a memo to the FBI saying that Clannagale, a revolutionary organization, was holding a meeting at Easter, at the Astor, I believe. And uh, this was a war time, and surely this should not be allowed, or they should find out something about it. And. J. Edgar Hoover replied that there are a number of splits in Clannagale, and consequently a number of Clannagales, and the one that's meeting at the Astor is not considered subversive. So those who know a lot about that period will understand what I'm talking about. Question. Question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you mentioned before about the early support for the Home Rule Party during the time of the Land League. Was there continuing support on the part of Clan the Gale for the Home Rule Party? And how did they, uh, uh, what was their stance during uh, the Parnell controversy? In oh, uh, a magnificent stance. Uh, <clears throat> they would not be dictated to by clerics or by English statesmen. They stood 100% behind Parnell and anybody who came to, from the Irish party to say otherwise, they did not give them a hearing. And if they couldn't prevent the hearing, they made sure that the true story was told. It's one of the Clannagale's finest hours. <clears throat> now in retirement, I sometimes watch CNN during the day, <clears throat> rather than writing news. And I was watching it the other day in the British elections. And uh, they interviewed uh, the, they dealt with Northern Ireland in the context of the British elections. And they interviewed James Molyneux, the uh, head of the official Unionist Party. They interviewed um, Ian Paisley, the head of the um, Democratic Unionist Party. And they interviewed John Hume of the SDLP. Each of them appeared directly on the interview. They told what uh, the Sinn Féin stands for. They did not interview uh, Jerry Adams. And the point about this at the end of it, <coughs> being in the news business, the first thing you want to find out is the source. And the source of this uh, cameo was ITN, British Independent News Service. And it is not their fault. I mean, CNN gets its news from them. CNN is very, very fair. Uh, and uh, under British law, the uh, members of Sinn Féin cannot appear on television. Under Irish law, the Republic of Ireland, the same is true. So I do believe 
that one direct way you can certainly challenge this because CNN does not want to be placed in the position of not censoring anybody is to ask CNN why is it that Jerry Adams did not appear and if ITN is unable to supply them because of British censorship laws should the American viewer be subject to British censorship laws. It strikes me as eminently logical, eminently fair, and something that the public should demand. That's what you can do. Well, uh, I don't know about the grave, I'm about to find out, but I'll tell you one interesting feature because of reading John Du Bois, I saw it. Oh, I beg your pardon. The grave of Colonel Kelly, Thomas Kelly, who was the successor to Stevens as the chief executive of the Fenian movement. And he died in the early part of this century, I'm not sure of the year, but it'd be around six, uh, 1907, 8 or 9, sometime like that. And John Du Bois, in his piece in the Gaelic American, <coughs> uh, said that he was surprised to learn that uh, Colonel Kelly was two weeks dead. And nobody knew anything about his death. And uh, that here was a man whose name at one point on three continents was known everywhere and that he died in obscurity. But I don't know where he's buried. Uh, I'm surprised to find that the grave is not far from Joe Stein's grave. And they can have an argument. <laughs> well, <laughs> sticking up out of the ground was a little insignia, metal, by the American Legion, and it said the Ohio Company. Was he in the Ohio Regiment? Yes. Right. And went over, and there's a little piece of stone. This is only about four months ago. There's a little piece of stone there, and took the dust off it. Said T.K. Kelly. He certainly deserves to be honored. Right.